After that attack, still more lives were lost at the Battle of the Java Sea. Japan sank 10 Allied ships, including the USS Houston and the USS Perch. And as CNN's Ivan Watson reports, the wreckage from five of those ships has mysteriously vanished. The USS Houston and the USS Perch. Two Navy ships that were sunk by the Japanese in a series of naval battles that began on February 27, 1942 in the Java Sea. One of the worst naval defeats for the Allies in World War II. The Japanese Navy crushed a coalition of warships from the U.S., Britain, Australia, and the Netherlands, sinking at least eight ships in several days of fighting off the coast of what is now Indonesia. In the run-up to the 75th anniversary of the battle, a diving expedition recently made a disturbing discovery. The wrecks of the U.S. submarine Perch and at least four Dutch and British warships, some of which are seen in this rare archive footage, completely disappeared off the bottom of the sea, leaving Indonesian officials baffled. It hasn't been identified whether it has, it has moved uh, or whether it has been stolen. It's not, the, the point is that it's not there, where it was once there. Britain and the Netherlands condemned the disappearance. Here's why some people are so upset about the missing warships. The relatives and governments of sailors who died on board view the undersea wrecks as maritime war graves that should be respected and protected just like any other World War II cemetery where hundreds of fallen servicemen are buried. In 2014, the U.S. Navy held this ceremony over the final resting place of the USS Houston, a cruiser that fought to the death against the Japanese, alongside the Australian ship Perth, before both ships sank with a combined loss of life of more than 1,000 sailors. My dad was able to survive the sinking. He literally was the only person that got out of the lower uh, deck uh, turret number one team because he was a young man, he was only 17 years old. After the war, Otto Schwartz started a survivors group that's now led by his son, John, who is now deeply worried by the disappearance of other ships in the region. We're on eggshells. We're, we're very anxious and very disturbed, and we're just praying and hoping uh, that no further damage gets done to either our ship or any others. Two years ago, U.S. Navy divers visiting the Houston discovered scavengers systematically looted the wreck. Experts say hoisting an entire warship off the bottom of the sea would be logistically challenging. But if you could do it, professional Indonesian shipbreakers tell CNN, the scrap metal from one vessel alone would easily be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. To do things such as we're talking about would be equivalent for someone to go into Arlington National Cemetery with an excavating equipment and start digging up coffins and, and, and graves. It's the same thing. The Indonesian and Dutch governments have agreed to launch a joint investigation to solve the mystery of what happened to the final resting place of so many sailors. Ivan Watson, CNN, Hong Kong. Finally from us today, beloved astronaut and U.S. Senator John Glenn has died. He was 95 years old and had been hospitalized for more than a week. Glenn was an American hero, the son of a plumber. He served in World War II and the Korean War as a Marine pilot. Roger, the clock is operating. We're underway. Later, of course, he became a pioneer in the golden age of space travel, the first American to orbit the Earth. First glimpse of the conquering hero. John H. Glenn, he left his footprints among the stars. The astronaut's career was immortalized in the iconic 1983 movie, The Right Stuff, but Glenn was not yet finished. The American legend went on to represent the state of Ohio in the U.S. Senate for 24 years, although he didn't achieve his goal of making it all the way to the White House when he ran for president in 1984. The nomination of my party, I firmly believe I can beat Ronald Reagan. At the age of 77, Glenn blazed another trail into space, this time aboard the space shuttle Discovery, the oldest astronaut ever to take flight. Glenn's bravery, his curiosity, his pride, and his 
good nature inspired a nation. He was truly, his was truly a life well lived. President Obama said Glenn's life inspired us to reach for the heavens. And President-elect Trump today mourned the loss of a great pioneer. But perhaps NASA summed it up best this afternoon, echoing the words that Mission Control told him 54 years ago. Godspeed, John Glenn. That's it for the lead. I'm Jake Tapper. I turn you over to Wolf Blitzer now. He's in the situation room. Happening now, faux cabinet. President-elect Donald Trump names hardliners to key cabinet-level positions, men who oppose actions and regulations of the agencies they will lead. Is Trump looking to dismantle parts of the federal government as we know it? Burger boss. Trump taps the man behind this ad to head the Labor Department, a fast food CEO known for promoting his brands with racy commercials. Why is he opposed to increasing the minimum wage? Putin up a fight. Democrats and Republicans are now divided over whether Russian President Vladimir Putin was involved in cyber attacks and leaked emails in an effort to influence the U.S. election. Why is Putin now a fault line in U.S. politics? Thank you very much. Thank you. And new terror tactics. A chilling report warns of new ISIS methods to attack the West, including car bombs and possibly chemical weapons. Are ISIS operatives standing by to strike? I'm Wolf Blitzer. You're in the Situation Room. President-elect Donald Trump is on the road this hour. He'll be heading to Des Moines, Iowa, where he'll hold a, his latest so-called thank you rally later tonight. But first, a visit to Ohio State University, where the president-elect has asked to meet with victims of that ISIS-inspired terror attack, as well as first responders. And we're learning more right now about new additions to his administration. Trump has picked fast food CEO Andrew Puzder uh, to be labor secretary. Uh, Puzder uh, opposes a higher minimum wage and broader overtime pay. And Trump has named Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt to head the Environmental Protection Agency. Pruitt does not believe in climate change and he's sued the EPA multiple times over power plant regulations. And new tonight, a disturbing warning about new terror tactics being adopted by ISIS. A European report says as terrorist forces lose ground in Syria and Iraq, they're becoming experts at using car bombs, which they could soon bring to the West. We're covering that much more this hour with our guests, including Congressman Adam Schiff, the ranking uh, member of the House Intelligence Committee, and our correspondents and expert analysts are also standing by. Let's begin with Donald Trump's latest appointments to his administration. Our senior Washington correspondent, Jeff Zeleny, he's in Des Moines, Iowa for us. Uh, Jeff, uh, the president-elect will be holding his next thank you rally where you are later tonight. Update our viewers. Wolf, of course, he won the state of Iowa just one month ago. Now, Donald Trump is moving ever increasingly to fill up his cabinet, naming his pick for labor secretary and uh, his pick to lead the EPA. As he moves closer to the Oval Office, some of his actions are more presidential, but his skin seems as thin as ever. As Donald Trump adds new names to his cabinet, it's clear how much his world has changed since winning the presidency one month ago tonight. As he takes to Twitter, it's clear how much still hasn't. He's still blasting his critics personally. An Indiana union leader is his latest target. Uh, he didn't tell the truth. Uh, he inflated the numbers, and uh, I called him out on it. Chuck Jones, president of the Steelworkers Union at the Carrier Factory Trump visited last week, appearing on CNN's New Day, the morning after being attacked by Trump. It started last night when Jones told CNN's Aaron Burnett that Trump exaggerated by saying 1,100 jobs would be saved from going to Mexico. They're counting in uh, 350 some odd more than we're never leaving this country at all. We had a lot of our members, when the word was coming out of 1,100, they thought uh, that they would have a job. Trump, it seems, was watching and fired back on Twitter 20 minutes later saying Jones has done a terrible job representing workers. No wonder companies flee country. An hour later, another shot. If United Steelworkers 1999 was any good, they would have kept those jobs in Indiana, Trump tweeted. Spend more time working, less time talking. Tonight, Trump keeps adding to his cabinet. CNN has learned he has selected fast food restaurant executive Andrew Puzder as labor secretary. 
He's the CEO of Hardee's and Carl's Jr. and opposes raising the minimum wage. He has supported some immigration reforms, but drawn criticism for racy ads promoting his burgers. I don't think there's anything wrong with a beautiful woman in a bikini eating a burger and washing a, a, a Bentley or a, a pickup truck or being in a hot tub. I think there's probably nothing more American. Trump also has selected Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt to lead the EPA. Pruitt, who has deep ties to the fossil fuel industry, has denied the existence of climate change. The choices alarm Democrats, including Senator Tim Kaine, who spoke to CNN's Manu Raju. If someone does not accept basic climate science, what other science don't they accept? Mm -hmm. So I'm very, very troubled about that. Trump's team is now more than half complete. The most anticipated position of Secretary of State is still open. Some choices and some of his policy proposals signal an unconventional presidency. The script to what we're doing is not yet written. His victory tour rolls on tonight with a stop in Iowa, following an afternoon visit to Ohio to meet first responders and victims of the stabbing attack last week at Ohio State University. Now, Donald Trump will be joined here tonight by the vice president-elect Mike Pence, and they will make the introduction of Terry Branstead, the longest-serving governor in the country, of course, the governor of Iowa, who is the new choice to be the ambassador to China. So, Wolf, this victory tour rolls on. Tomorrow, the stops are in Michigan and Louisiana. Wolf. All right, thanks very much, Jeff Zeleny, reporting for us. We're also learning new details right now about Donald Trump's transition plans, including potential conflicts of interest and the role of his adult children. CNN political reporter Sarah Murray is joining us now. Sarah, you're learning new information from your sources. Update our viewers on that. Well, that's right, Wolf. We know Donald Trump has been having meetings about how to better separate himself from his business now that he's the president-elect. And, of course, he's teased a big press conference to announce his plans next week. But what we are learning is, as of now, there's really no indication that Donald Trump is going to fully divest from his company, which means there are still going to be questions about whether there are conflict of in conflicts of interest that could potentially follow him throughout his four- or eight-year tenure in the White House. Now, the other thing we have learned is that when he does hand and over control of his businesses, at least to his two sons, potentially his daughter as well, he may install another independent person as part of that organizational structure, someone who is not a member of his family. This could be a move that he could do to further insulate himself from claims of conflict of interest. But it was interesting when I spoke to a source about this, they said it's not because Donald Trump himself is worried about the criticism, is worried about the backlash. No, it's that he wants to protect and shield his children from any of that wolf and the word uh, at least in the new york times sarah that his daughter ivanka and son-in-law jared kushner they will move to washington she will take a leave of absence uh, from uh, or from the, the big business uh, what are you hearing about that that's right. The New York Times is reporting she will take a leave of absence. Others have been a little bit less certain about what exactly her role will be in the business, but they are certain of one thing. She and Jared Kushner are both going to be playing roles in Washington, whether they're formal or informal, a source told me. You can really think of Ivanka Trump as sort of a stand-in first lady. She is going to be a Washington hostess, but beyond that, she's also going to be a policy advisor to her father on some less uh, conservative issues. Obviously, we saw her way in throughout the presidential campaign on paid family leave. That's something she wants to continue working on when her father is in the White House, but also on climate change issues. Now, that could uh, put her in an interesting position at odds with the man Donald Trump just chose to lead the EPA, but gives you an indication of the different perspectives he wants to take along with him to the White House, Wolf. And the incoming first lady, uh, Melania uh, Trump, she's going to stay in New York for the rest of the school year so their son Barron can finish school in New York City. All right, Sarah, thanks very much for that. Let's get some more on all of this. A Democratic Congressman Adam Schiff of California is joining us. He's the ranking member of the Intelligence Committee. Congressman, thanks very much for joining us. Great to be with you. First of all, on this uh, whole issue of a potential conflict of interest, do you see a problem there? What is he, what is he supposed to do? He can't sell that entire business, right? Well, I, I think it's an enormous problem, and I think he has to divest himself uh, and his family of the business. There's no way that he can divorce himself of the knowledge he has of where the assets are located uh, and how his decisions as president can affect his business interests. Uh, and the country will uh, always wonder, as long as he has those business interests, is he doing this because he wants to continue doing business in Turkey? Is he doing it because he wants to grow his business in Russia? Is it because he has loans from China? But those are not questions we want the nation to be asking. Uh, he has a country to run. It's a big enough job without uh, the conflict presented by his business. Well, when you say divest his business, what does that mean? 
Well, that means I, I think he does need to sell off the businesses. I sell think. the entire Trump organization? I, I think that he needs to make sure that his family, including his uh, children, uh, are not uh, owning that business, running that business, uh, and presenting him with a, a supreme conflict of interest. Uh, I think it may raise a constitutional question on the Emoluments Clause. But more than that, uh, it raises tremendous, uh, an tremendous appearance of impropriety, uh, if not a uh, risk of actual impropriety. You see a problem uh, with some of these foreign embassies here in Washington, Bahrain, Azerbaijan, hosting events at the new Trump Hotel down the street from the White House? Uh, absolutely. And, and remember, this is a president-elect who, even 10 days before the election, was uh, pumping his hotels, doing events at his hotels, marketing his hotels right in the midst of a presidential campaign. If he's going to do that during the campaign, why on earth would we think he's going to stop promoting the businesses after the campaign? But people knew all that about uh, Donald Trump. They knew he had a huge business in real estate and casinos and country clubs. Uh, but he was elected president of the United States. They knew all about him. They knew that he had these business interests. Uh, they may have hoped that if he became president that he would deal with the conflicts of interest as other presidents have. Uh, we've seen a lot of those hopes prove illusory uh, on other issues, uh, and I hope this one is not another disappointment. We'll see specifically the legal uh, impact of what he decides to do. He's going to have a news conference December 15th spelling out what he and his lawyers have come up with. Uh, we'll, of course, have extensive, extensive coverage of that. Let's move on to some other uh, news that we're following right now. Uh, Scott Pruitt, the Oklahoma Attorney General, uh, climate change denier. What's your reaction to that? My reaction is this is the kind of appointment you make when you not only want to radically change policy, but you want to poke people in the eye do it. Uh, this was, I think, a terrible choice uh, to put a climate denier in this position. It basically tells not only the country, but the rest of the world, we are giving up our leadership on this issue. We're giving up our leadership. Uh, we're diminishing our standing in the world when it comes to advocating for the planet uh, and combating climate change. Uh, it's, it's another peg down, I think, in our, our global standing in it. Uh, it, it worries me uh, terribly. Uh, this, this person could end up presiding over the dismantlement of one of our key agencies and, and a protector of the environment. Well, during the campaign, uh, Donald Trump made a secret about uh, his disdain for the Environmental Protection Agency, which he is going to be heading if he's confirmed by the Senate. And the Republicans have the majority in the Senate. Realistically, uh, do you see any possibility he might not be confirmed? Uh, well, he's about as toxic a nominee as you can get. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that given they have the votes, it depends on which battles Democrats in the Senate choose to fight. I think they will fight this one. I think they'll fight the attorney general. Uh, whether they'll succeed or not may depend on how much public opinion can be moved. Uh, but they've got to try, uh, regardless of the outcome. And what do you think about Andrew uh, Puzder, uh, who's, uh, been, who's going to be nominated by the president-elect to become the labor secretary? He's someone who's on the record saying uh, he opposes an increase, for example, in the minimum wage. Well, you know, yet another appointment that would be more apropos if it were the anti-labor department or the anti-environmental protection agency. Uh, these are folks who are, I think, uh, very disparaging of the responsibilities that they're going to take on. This is someone who doesn't represent workers at all, who's against the minimum wage, who's against the overtime rules that would reward those who are working longer hours. Uh, so I, th I think another sop to the base, the hardcore base of the GOP, does nothing to bridge the divide that the president-elect talked about in the context of the Time Magazine story. These are steps that will only aggravate the divide between Americans. Well, Puzder may be opposed to increasing the minimum wage, but during the campaign when I interviewed Donald Trump, he said he was open to raising the minimum wage to about $10 an hour. Presumably, the president of the United States can tell the labor secretary, if he's confirmed by the Senate, to go ahead and support an increase in the minimum wage, right? Presumably, uh, and we'll see how far... Why do you say presumably? Well, <laughs> I, I don't think anyone knows who's really going to be running this government, uh, how much he's going to delegate decisions like this. This, you know, this president-elect, I think, is someone who uh, is content in many respects to say, I don't want to be bothered with the small decisions, uh, just I want to be the chief uh, decider. Uh, whether he will actively engage himself on minimum wage issues, whether he'll use the muscle necessary as president uh, to work with a Congress where many in the GOP don't want to increase the minimum wage, I have to say, appointments like this don't give me much confidence that he will fight to fulfill those promises. Well, do you think uh, the vice president, Mike Pence, will effectively be running the government and he'll sort of stay above all of that? Is that what I'm hearing you say? I don't know that the vice president will. I think, as we saw in the campaign, 
Uh, the president like bridled whenever it was suggested that Mike Pence ought to be at the top of the ticket uh, or that he was going to do or say anything uh, that contradicted the president. In fact, you remember quite well when uh, the, the president like slapped down the vice president uh, for disagreeing with him over Syria. Uh, so I don't think that's going to happen, but I, I can see the president elect delegating tremendous discretion to agency heads uh, and simply not being interested in the day to day working of the government. Uh, he's not taking regular intelligence briefings. He's spending more time at uh, celebratory rallies than he is preparing himself for the job. So you don't like these two potential nominees for EPA for Labor Secretary, but you do like some of the others. Who do you like? I do. Uh, well, I like General Mattis a great deal. I, I think he's uh, just a, he's going to be he's going to be nominated for Defense Secretary. Uh, I think he's a superb choice. Uh, and you'll there vote is, to, there and, is, and you think there should be a waiver allowing him to be? You know, I I think he should be judged on the merits, and I've been strongly inclined to support a waiver. I have to say, though, I'm getting a lot of heartburn, Wolf, over the fact that he is populating other positions, uh, key positions in the cabinet with other generals. Uh, that raises further question about whether there's really going to be civilian leadership. Uh, and that does concern me. Uh, one of the yet to be filled positions of Secretary of State, if he puts another general there, uh, that is only going to magnify those concerns. But I like what Mattis has to say about torture. He's against it. I like what he has to say about Russia. He'll talk some sense, I hope, into the president-elect that Putin is not our friend. I like his strong support of NATO. I like his strong pushback uh, against Iran's conventional malevolence. There's a lot to like about Mattis. There's a lot to like about General Kelly, another good choice, although we don't know that for much. For Homeland Security Secretary. Uh, for Homeland Security. We don't know that much about his views on immigration, uh, so the, the senators need to do some thorough vetting. Uh, but these are solid people, and, and uh, with General Kelly, you have someone who knows uh, in the most uh, painful and intimate of terms, what it's like to commit our service members to battle and to lose uh, a family member. Yeah, he's a gold star father. His son, uh, Second Lieutenant Robert Kelly, was killed in action in Afghanistan. And uh, General Kelly has spoken about that very movingly indeed. We have more to discuss, Congressman. I'm going to take a quick break. We'll resume our conversation right after this. today straight to the source would israel be willing to go along with those demands to a side you haven't seen that sounds a young man's game all the way to the heart of a problem what is going on in ferguson missouri in downtown america maybe all the way to the president do you think you were naive back then the lead with jake tapper weekdays at four Every day we do stories about people in need. With CNN's Impact Your World, you can help. When you go to the Impact Your World section at CNN.com, you'll find more on the stories that move you. Plus, you can find out just what you can do to help. Links to reputable charities and organizations. Find out more on New Day and go to CNN.com slash impact. Be the change. Take action. Make an impact. 